I'm Peter Block in Orlando, Florida at the ACC annual meeting, and I'm here for On the Scene. With me is a newcomer to my immediate left, Bina Ahmed from Dartmouth, and our old friend Deepak Bhatt uh, from the Brigham and Women's, and we are here to talk about what's hot in interventional trials here at ACC at the annual meeting. Uh, we struggled a little bit this year, didn't we, uh, to figure out whether or not there was really anything that was great. And we came up with four. So I've got a cheat sheet here. Secure PCI, Compass, Notion, and Define Flare. And if you don't know what they are, you'll know in a minute. So I'm going to start out with Compass. So, uh, I'm sorry, so let's start out with uh, Secure PCI. Deepak, give me your ideas on this one. Sure, I, I guess I'm a little more excitable than you are. I, I thought there was some <laughs> good stuff here, including what we're going to discuss. Secure PCI, or Secure, looked at patients getting pre-treated with high dose atorvastatin. It was ACS patients, a proportion of whom received PCI. The overall trial didn't hit its p-value, but the PCI patients, especially the STEMI PCI, it looked like there was an effect that I happen to think is biologically plausible. But even if you worship at the ultra p-values, don't believe any of it, I'm going to be giving those patients statins anyway, and if I can get it in ahead of the procedure and get it in early, why wouldn't I do that? Yeah, I, I, uh, Bina, you know, if you had an infarct, I hope you don't. I, I don't I want you to have an infarct. So uh, but if you have an infarct, I mean, you want to be started on torvastatin. Absolutely, and, and so the clinical impact of these findings is, is hard to know. Um, but uh, they, they do suggest that uh, and remind us that there is a benefit for statins in yeah. our ACS patients. In the pl I Atorvastatin doesn't work within 24 hours for all intents and purposes. The LDL drop isn't going to be the thing that makes the difference. Mm -hmm. But the pleiotropic effects probably are something anti-inflammatory, mm -hmm. whatever. And it probably applies to other statins, such as Rosuvastatin mm -hmm. as well. The trial was Atorvastatin yeah. 80, but probably whatever. other high-intensity, yeah. high probably a class statins. effect. Okay, let's move on. Compass. Now, there's an interesting trial, right? The Compass Peripheral Vascular Disease Trial. And it introduced the concept of MAIL, which... Uh, is tricky, major adverse limb events. So go ahead, go ahead, Bina, let's go through this one. Well, this is a, a, a sub-study from the COMPASS trial looking at the patients with PAD. About 10% of the patients uh, in the original trial had PAD. And two of the findings I thought that were striking was one, that having male is not good for you, no, no pun intended. And, um, and the second was that if you were to treat these patients with low dose rivaroxaban and aspirin, you tend to affect their outcomes in a positive manner. Yeah, Deepak, you would agree that's probably what really comes out of this trial is the uh, anticoagulation plus aspirin issue. Yeah, absolutely, though I think any work that is highlighting the high event rates in PAD patients is important because mm -hmm. even though that part of the message is entirely new, PAD is still underdetected and undertreated, but, but I do think the important contribution from this uh, paper, it also came out in Jack, is that rivaroxaban at a low dose plus aspirin can modify these peripheral events, including amputation, uh, but also the cardiac events. I asked you a question during our previous wrap up, and that is, if you had a little claudication, but you knew you had PAD, would you anticoagulate yourself and add some aspirin uh, with rivarox? And, uh, it's an interesting question. I don't think we know the answer yet, and perhaps there'll be a trial. Well, you know, there were patients, uh, a fair number that had symptomatic PAD, some that just had stable coronary artery disease, and some that had both. And the benefit of low-dose rivaroxaban plus aspirin was consistent in all those mm -hmm. folks. Yeah. And the PAD cohort did include people with claudication. I think we're going to move to more anticoagulation for atherosclerotic disease. Everybody agree with that one? I think so in yeah. low bleeding risk right. patients. Yeah, you know, exactly. Folks that are high bleeding risk, an 80-year-old at you know, really high bleeding risk you might be more cautious. But in someone that's otherwise young and healthy but has bad atherosclerosis, yes, I think yeah. so. Yeah. Okay, so we're agreed on that one. So the notion trial. The Nordic uh, transcatheriotic valve replacement. I'm going to punt this one to Bina. <laughs> uh, sure. This, uh, like you said, a, a Nordic trial comparing TAVR to SAVR. In a fairly low risk uh, group of patients, uh, you had to be older than 70 to get in, but the mean STS was between three and four, so a, a low risk cohort overall. And they reported their five year outcomes data comparing TAVR to SAVR. Uh, and in essence, uh, uh, the, the punchline was there was no difference between the two groups in terms of r rates of stroke, MI, or, or mortality. However, there uh, was a signal for increased rates 
of um, prosthetic valve regurgitation related to TAVR compared to SAVR. So not a surprise, but, but definitely a, a, a significant finding. And then the second aspect that was um, uh, maybe a, a little more than we had anticipated uh, in terms of its impact was the need for permanent pacemaker implantation. And the permanent pacemaker implantation had a reflection on mortality longer exactly. term, which right. is uh, a little disconcerting. We used to talk about the, uh, the Achilles heel of angioplasty being restenosis. Right. The Achilles yeah. heel of TAVR is a double one, I think. The, Paravalvar leak AR business and the pacer issue. Absolutely, and when you're talking about young patients in particular, that might not be their last pacemaker, right? They might need a generator change, problems come up with the lead. So, you know, I, I think, yes, in an older patient that's otherwise low surgical risk, sure, Tavarum, but in a younger patient, I think we need more data. Yeah, and the lo I, things are going to change. I mean, the devices are going to get better, Tavar is going to be an easier thing to do, et cetera, et cetera. It's pretty easy already. And, but the fact of the matter is, I think we still need to not simply say we're sliding down the slope of decreasing risk and there's no end to that. I think we need to stop and say, wait a minute, there are some patients where surgical aortic valve replacement is not a bad idea. I used right. to say the surgical aortic valve replacement was the best operation cardiac surgeons did. I still believe that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Peter, one other, one other thing to, to mention is, you know, as the devices evolve, uh, they've really focused on lowering rates of uh, perivalvular uh, leak related to the TAVR prostheses. And I think in the process with the thicker skirt, we're starting to see maybe an inflection for pacemaker rates as a consequence of, of the change in the geometry of the, of the it valve. It also depends a lot on how high or how low you place the, right. the device. And there's lots of factors that run into this, but bottom line right. is, you've got about a one in five or six mm -hmm. chance of having a pacer right. if you have a TAVR. And longer term, it, it, it increases. So right. we'll see how this all plays out. One, but other, one other thing, Peter, I, I, it was interesting to note, this wasn't mentioned in the, in the discussions, but there was a, also a signal for higher rates of infective endocarditis almost twice the rate for TAVR valves compared to the SAVR valve. Now why should that be? Yeah, I don't know. It was 6 to 10 percent um, yeah. uh, in the two groups, and it, it's a little curious uh, whether it was clinical uh, endocarditis, was it you know, thrombus on the leaflets that was misconstrued as endocarditis. That's so, a good point. That yeah. might be perhaps more likely because there really hasn't been that signal in the mm -hmm. other trials in medium and high-risk mm -hmm. patients. Yeah, that'll yeah. be interesting to watch. To follow, yeah. All right, so we have one more, and that's defined flare. I was not <laughs> Candidly, totally impressed by defined flare, the yeah, IFR I have to versus. You to cover it. <laughs> I know, but we're going to cover it because Deepak <laughs> loves this trial, and uh, the cost decrease is uh, worth it to Deepak. So, Deepak, I'm going to give the trial to you. Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, this is a trial already published in New England Journal of Medicine. What was presented here was the cost effectiveness analyses for IFR versus FFR, and IFR looked cost effective which I believe because, you know, there's all sorts of things that go on when you're doing FFR. You have to give adenosine, generally speaking. That costs money in certain labs. That can cost a fair amount, actually, depends on where you are. And also, IFR is quicker and easier. It's shorter procedure because you don't have to keep giving adenosine for multi-vessel uh, IFR versus FFR. So I think it's another win for IFR, but more broadly, you know, IFR and FFR, they're both underutilized. I mean, I think that's the bigger message. Mm -hmm. You know, we could debate which one is more cost effective. I like IFR, you like FFR, fine. But the bigger message is there are a lot of intermediate lesions that, you know, perhaps shouldn't be treated that are getting treated, but vice versa, some that should get treated that aren't because we're not assessing them in the mm -hmm. cath lab for their hemodynamic significance. Uh, Bina, this whole business of Proving ischemia before you do an intervention is becoming more mm -hmm. center stage, and I think it appropriately mm -hmm. more center stage. Your comment on this, I mean, the whole business of if you give a drug, it's going to cost more than if you don't give a drug, is sort of self-evident, mm -hmm. it seems to me. So the trial from the beginning was going to be probably a positive one. But this is the issue that I think is really central. Mm -hmm. Your comment on this, Bina, and we'll call it a day. Yeah, absolutely. I think a physiologic assessment of, of lesions, some could argue, uh, even more severe lesions beyond intermediate uh, lesions should should require a physiologic assessment before we commit patients to treatment with stents. Uh, and and I think uh, there there needs to be a movement shift because uh, especially in the United States we're we're way underutilizers of the, physiologic the one assessment. One problem with it is there are a lot of people out there who don't do FFR uh, routinely, and if they start pushing wires down coronaries where they're not used to pushing wires through 
unstable plaque or whatever, that may be a little oh, bit of an but, issue. But I really think it should Although be the interventionalists doing it. I don't no, think no, it's no, a diagnostic. I, I mean, there might be labs that are having diagnostic folks doing it, but I don't think that's a wise thing yeah. to do at all. Right, right. It's uh, still a potential. But, you know, an, an interesting point you just made about, you know, even maybe some severe lesions, uh, I mean, I think if it's 80% or more, probably not, but the problem is your severe and my severe might be mm -hmm. different. You know, in an older era, everyone did QCA, or at mm -hmm. least where I was. Steve Ellis made us all do QCA, mm -hmm. uh, quantitative coronary angiography, and that really trains your eye. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think if you just look at it, usually people say, oh, it's 80%, but then you QCA it and it's 70%, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. Or it, 40. Yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, we'll call it a day. Thank you folks for being here.